and welcome to the AI Solutions Free Flyer webinar series, Optimize Your Constellations. We definitely greatly appreciate all of you taking the time to join us here today um, from all over the world. So thank you for making the time to uh, sit with us and learn with us. My name is Christopher Ulrich, and I am the AI Solutions Space Products Account Executive. Um, I'm going to be one of your moderators for today. And I'm also going to be joined by uh, Danny Bram. Um, Danny is also a Space Products Account Executive. Um, he's going to be monitoring the Q&A of the webinar a little, wait, uh, a little later today, so please stick around for that. Let's see. Well, we, we've got a bit of an exciting webinar here today. Um, we're going to be focusing on constellation optimization using FreeFlyer uh, by our very own Nate McCown. FreeFlyer Support Manager and Systems Engineer. So a little bit about Nate. Um, Nate's an alumnus of Alabama State University, uh, where he initially got his start using FreeFlyer in the Astrodynamics and Space Research Laboratory, the ASRL for Alabama State. There he uh, began to research constellation design, uh, remote sensing, station keeping, and also collision avoidance under Dr. Rohan Saad. He later joined the Free Flyer team as an intern in the summer of 2018, and he worked full time as a space systems engineer um, with AI Solutions ever since. And currently he supports the technical support team, um, helps with Free Flyer releases, training, and a whole host of other tasks here at AI Solutions. All right, now before I turn it over to Nate, I do want to go over a few uh, housekeeping items, just some things to, to keep in mind here. Just please note that um, all attendees will be muted throughout the call. Um, our cameras will be turned off for the duration of this webinar. We will be recording this webinar as well, um, so please keep in mind that we will be recording and we will also be providing the slides to everyone um, after the call as well in a PDF format. Now, if there are questions that come up during the call, um, we ask that you use the Q&A function within Teams to ask those questions, um, you know, whether they're regarding Free Flyer in general or uh, the presentation that Nate will be giving today. And then towards the end of that presentation, we'll have a Q&A section um, where we'll, we will be addressing these questions um, formally. So please, you know, please be active in, in that conversation. If you would like to chat with the call participants, the AI Solutions staff um, outside of questions, please use the chat function as well. Um, that would be separate from the Q&A function, so please keep those two conversation streams separate if you don't mind. And without further ado, I will now turn it over to, uh, to Nate, introducing Nate, who will go over the overview of uh, what we're going to cover today. Nate? Yeah, thanks, Chris. Can you hear me all right? Wonderful. Awesome. Thank you for the introduction. And we'll go ahead and get started. So yeah, as Chris mentioned, today we'll be focusing on constellation design and optimization, uh, specifically how it pertains to free flyer. Uh, just a little bit of background. As we all know, near, near space is becoming increasingly privatized with the number of satellites in low Earth orbits predicted to grow dramatically from roughly 5,500 at the present time to almost 50,000 by 2030 due to the launch of planned satellite constellations. So as we continue to explore deeper into space, the desire to design and deploy constellation of satellites around the moon or Mars is increasing. So in today's session, I'll be discussing how FreeFlyer can assist in designing, optimizing, and visualizing your constellation around any central body. So the first thing we'll talk about is constellation design using FreeFlyer and FreeFlyer specific formation object. And then we'll talk about tricks for mission plan optimization. We'll then talk about what is optimization and how it pertains to FreeFlyer specifically. And finally, we'll talk about region coverage time optimization, where we'll walk through an optimization example um, and build out our own sample. So we'll start things off with constellation design. So FreeFlyer has a formation object, which is a special case of a list of spacecraft. This allows you to propagate an entire constellation 
with a single step command. It allows you to visualize the formation using a single view or map command, and it allows you to visualize each spacecraft as a simple point or as a 3D model with a tail. Formations can be initialized via a two-line element set, so a TLE, a Rhinex broadcast ephemeris file, an SP3 precise ephemeris file, or explicitly defining the orbit states and free flyer script. And you can access the individual spacecraft in the formation using the following syntax. So it's the formation object and then an index. So in this case, we're saying I. We'll be focusing on explicitly defining the orbit states and free flyer script today. So we'll go ahead and talk through a few different types of constellations before taking a look at the actual script. So as you all are aware, there are many different types of constellations of spacecraft. Uh, there's single plane uh, constellations. So examples of this would include uniformly distributed spacecraft, which would allow to provide coverage of specific region. Multiplane, so some different patterns here. You have the Walker pattern, streets of coverage, rosettes or drain constellations, as well as many others. A hybrid, which would be a combination of constellations of different types. So this could be a single plane with a walker, single plane with the streets of coverage, or many different combinations of those constellation types. And then finally, we need to talk about the goal. So what is the goal of the constellation we're looking to design? Is it going to be global coverage, coverage of a specific region, optimizing inter-satellite linking, uh, or many different cases there? So let's talk through the order of operations in FreeFlyer. So the first thing here we'll have to do is create an object. So we'll create the formation objects or object and instantiate it with a name. So in this case, we're saying formation, and then my formation will be the name of the object in FreeFlyer. And then we need to specify the number of spacecraft in the formation. So the number of elements in a formation can be increased or decreased at any point in time by using the uh, by changing the value of the formation dot count property. Um, here you can see we've instantiated a, a formation, my formation, um, and given it a count of 12 directly in the index, or you can access it, as I mentioned, by using the formation dot count property. Additionally, you can use the formation dot clear method to reset the formation back to empty or to remove individual elements from a formation, you can use the formation.removeAt method call. And this could be useful if you're doing something like lifetime analysis or some of the satellites are deorbiting, but you want to continue the propagation for the remainder of your set. Next, we'll talk about editing your formation. So you have the ability to edit the, the formation through individual uh, spacecraft elements, or you can edit all the elements for all spacecraft using a loop. So in this example here, we've created a variable i, which we'll use for our for loop. We'll loop through the formation.count property. So that's going to allow us to access each individual spacecraft inside that formation and access their individual properties. So here we've set the Keplerian semi-major axis to 9,000 for each of the spacecraft in the formation, the eccentricity to 0.2, the inclination to 30, and then we're incrementing the right ascension of the ascending node by 30 degrees for each spacecraft in the set. So now that we've got a general understanding of how the formation object works in FreeFlyer, let's go ahead and take a look at designing a Walker constellation. So the objective for this is to design a FreeFlyer script to dynamically create a Walker Delta constellation. The script should allow us uh, should allow for multiple planes and multiple spacecraft per plane, and then we'll initialize this the constellation in script, starting with four planes and six satellite per plane. Starting things off, we'll take care of our variable declaration or variable creation. So we were told in our objective that we want four planes. So we'll set a variable in planes equal to four, and this represents the number of orbital planes for our formation object. We'll then create a space or create a variable in spacecraft per plane, and this is representing these six satellites per plane. Next, we need to go ahead and create our formation object. We'll call this const. And then we set the count. So the count of this formation is going to be equal to the, the number of planes times the spacecraft per plane. So in this case, we're creating a formation called const with 24 satellites. The next thing we do is we are going to edit the formation in the loop. So we're going to go ahead and iterate through a for loop um, through each of the planes first. And then we're going to set the right ascension of the ascending node increment value set equal to 360 times the increment over the number of planes. And this is essentially representing the Walker Delta constellation setup because the orbital planes are going to be evenly distributed 
over the full 360 degree range of the right ascension. Once we've taken care of each plane, we can go ahead and edit each individual spacecraft inside that specific plane. We're going to space these satellites out across the true, or the true anomaly, and then we're going to additionally set the right ascension for that specific plane. On the right-hand side, you can see a single, uh, single plane of this set where we can see uh, there's going to be, in this case, it's actually 10 satellites, uh, but that's one specific plane at one specific uh, right ascension value. The last thing to do is to propagate the constellation. In this case, we're going to propagate for two days. And then we're going to utilize the view and the step command because that allows us to uh, propagate the entire formation using that one single, uh, single command, as well as the view command to visualize in 3D the formation we just created. So we'll go ahead and give this a run. So what we should see is we should have six planes of spacecraft. Uh, with each plane having, or I'm sorry, four planes of spacecraft with each plane having six satellites per, per plane. And here we can see uh, how they're spaced out over the right ascension over that full 360 degree range, as well as the true anomaly spacing inside each individual plane. So we'll let this run for just a bit. And we'll go ahead. And in this case, we're viewing the entire formation as a group and that or as individual spacecraft rather and that's going to allow us to see the orbit tails as well as the 3d models for each of these spacecraft and if we had any additional sensors on board we could also see that in this 3d representation we'll talk more about mission uh, in the tips and tricks about the view window optimization so moving right along we'll talk through some tricks for mission plan optimization when using formations We'll go ahead and start with the uh, the first tip is to use mean element sets. So for large scale constellations, it's often necessary to choose initial states very carefully so that we can reduce the need for station keeping maneuvers as the orbits evolve. For this reason, we're always going to recommend using a mean element set such as J2 Briarlodane rather than Keplerian elements. And the Briarlodane mean element sets uh, account for realistic perturbations to Earth's gravity model and are constructed based on an average over time and therefore have a more stable period. In comparison, the Keplerian oscillating elements are purely instantaneous values that treat the orbit as a classical two-body system. That is that they assume that the central body can be represented as a point mass. And for that reason, when using Keplerian elements for initialization with a high fidelity force model, the elements will vary significantly over the course of a single orbit. So here we can see in the bottom, we have a graph where we're just representing the spacecraft's Keplerian or, or the spacecraft's Keplerian semi-major axis, which is the blue oscillating line in comparison to the Briarlodane semi-major axis, which is the red line, which you can see over the course of a few orbits stays way, uh, way more stable in comparison to the Keplerian orbital element. As an example, we have a mission plan. Uh, the mission plan here that I'll go ahead and give a run. This mission plan here demonstrates the advantages of initializing a equally spaced formation around a circular orbit using J2 Briarlodane elements as opposed to the Keplerian elements. So we start on the right hand side by initializing the spacecraft using Keplerian elements, propagate for some duration, and then output the along track drift. You can see that over the course of a three day propagation, we have uh, the along track drift compared to the relative uh, range between neighboring satellites on the order of four to 5,000 kilometers. And then in comparison, on the left-hand side, what we've done here is we've reinitialized the formation, uh, refining that value using the Briarlodane element set. And you can see that the distance between the neighboring spacecraft is maintained within a given tolerance over the course of the propagation time. To better represent this, we've equalized the axes. Uh, if you were to zoom in on the graph in the bottom left, the along track separation is on the order of 30 kilometers uh, in comparison to the Keplerian formation, which we can see obviously is much larger than that. Next thing we'll talk about is tuning your tuning the fidelity of your force model. So the force model object in Free Flyer defines the forces that will be modeled and the accelerations that are applied when a spacecraft or formation are propagated using the step command. In order to calculate the trajectory of a spacecraft, a numerical integrator accesses the forces defined by the force model. And similar to the integrators, the way the force model is configured can have a massive impact on the accuracy and or runtime of your mission plan. 
So here you can see a few different examples of from simple, ranging from simple force model configurations with a point mass, which is the lowest fidelity, but is going to be the fastest in terms of runtime, a moderate fidelity, which is a four by four earth gravity zonal and tessaral potential terms with an analytic atmosphere density model. That'll be a bit slower than the point mass uh, example above, but will have higher fidelity all the way up to a 20 by 20 earth gravity model with Chakir Roberts atmospheric density, sun and moon point masses included, and that's going to be a higher fidelity for an earth orbiting spacecraft or earth orbiting formation, but it is going to be slower in comparison to the point mass um, force model configuration. You can scale this up even higher beyond 20 by 20 earth gravity, uh, but the point of this is that based on the level of fidelity for your analysis that you're looking for, that can be scaled uh, alongside your force model. All right, the next tip is to pre-compute orbit propagation. So pre-compute a formation's orbit propagation and save the states to an ephemeris file. What this allows you to do is it allows you to compute multiple orbit products alongside your, uh, using your ephemeris file and different mission plans. This allows you to do things like contact analysis, probability of collision calculations, shadow times, or really use any interval method in free flyer. And the reason for this is that because interpolating the ephemeris is going to be much faster than reintegrating orbit propagation each time you run your mission plan. So once you've defined your constellation or designed the constellation and you've come to terms that you like what you have, you can go ahead and run your propagation for however long, create that ephemeris file, and then use that ephemeris file to create the orbit products or the products in your separate mission plans. As mentioned, uh, for view window efficiency, uh, the once you have formations larger than 100 spacecraft, we're going to recommend viewing them in a group uh, inside the view window. So in the example at the bottom, uh, we have the view as a group property set equal to zero. This is where you can see the orbit tail, the 3D model, the sensors on board the spacecraft. And in this example, we're running both the view as group property equal to zero and view as group property equal to one for a two day propagation. You can see that the runtime is on the order of three times longer when we're including those 3D models, including those sensors for that propagation in comparison to drawing each spacecraft as a dot without drawing the tail, uh, which optimizes performance. So as we see on the right hand side, we have each spacecraft represented as a dot. We get about three runs in before we actually finish the mission plan here on the left hand side, which has all the additional features. This really only impacts your performance if you're working with those larger formations. So you'll see in a lot of our mission plans, things like Starlink or OneWeb, we have uh, by default those, those uh, mission plans set to view as group equal to one so that we have that uh, less of an impact on performance. So now we'll talk about actual optimization and how it pertains to free flyer. So first, what is optimization? The goal of optimi an optimization process is to find a solution to a problem which minimizes or maximizes some quality or quantity, I'm sorry. Uh, you can think of this as finding the best solution rather than just any solution. You can think of these solutions like finding a local or for some algorithms global minimum or maximum of, uh, of a function. Some astrodynamics applications include maneuver planning, um, coverage or constellation coverage, which we'll talk about here today interplanetary trajectory design, and more. If you've used FreeFlyer before, um, you're probably familiar with the targeter. Um, the targeter is available on the engineered tier. The targeter finds a feasible solution to a problem, and it does this by solving a two-point boundary value problem using the differential corrector method. The differential corrector uses seed values for the in input properties to determine the output values for other properties, then compares the output to the desired goals, adjusts the input, and iterates the targeting loop until the output is within some specified tolerance. As mentioned, this is likely a feasible solution and not an optimal solution. Whereas the optimizer, which is available on the mission tier, can find a feasible solution similar to the targeter, or it can continue to find an optimal solution. It works to, find, uh, works to maximize a user-defined objective function and it is object oriented or has an object oriented interface. The targeter can be used to generate initial guesses to pass into the optimizer. We have a sample mission plan called optimizer seeded from target, 
which uh, that mission plan uses free flyers optimization capability to minimize the local required delta V of a finite maneuver uh, to adjust the spacecraft's elliptical orbit to achieve a longitude value. The targeting loop is run beforehand uh, to generate the initial guesses for the burn parameters and then pass that along to the optimizer as initial guesses. For some optimization vocabulary, a few that we'll be hitting on here today include state variables, constraints, and the objective function. So the state variables are the parameters that are going to be varied with each iteration of the optimizer. You can see on the right-hand side of the graph here, the constraints, which is the red hash section here on the right-hand side, is, are going to be the conditions which must be met for a solution to be considered feasible. And then finally, the objective function is the qual quantity that needs to be minimized or maximized. So what is the solution space here on the right? A feasible solution is going to be a solution um, if all constraints are satisfied within a user specified tolerance. Feasible solution is demonstrated here on the right by the translucent green area, wherein the point inside those regions would be considered feasible. The optimal solution is if all constraints are satisfied and the solution minimizes or maximizes the objective function. So the optimal solution will be found within the red hashed area where the objective function is minimized or maximized. So the green is going to be our feasible solution. And then what we're going to be expanding on here today is the optimal solution, which you can find in that red hashed area. So now that we have a little bit of a background on optimization, we're going to talk through using FreeFlyer's optimization capabilities for region coverage time optimization. So similar to the Walker Constellation example, we're just going to walk through an objective and then talk about how FreeFlyer can be used to solve our problem. So for the region coverage time optimization, the objective is using FreeFlyer's optimization capability to configure a LEO constellation of 30 spacecraft for coverage of the continental United States. The constellation is divided into five planes with six spacecraft per plane. And the optimizer should vary the inclination of the planes and the semi-major axis of the spacecraft. A cost function should be established based on the semi-major axis to enable FreeFlyer to find the best coverage at the lowest altitude. So back to our optimization vocabulary. The state variables in this problem, based on the objective that we just talked about, uh, the inclination and the semi-major axis are the, going to be the two properties we want to be varied with each iteration of the optimizer. In the problem statement, we were told that the uh, we're going to be working with a LEO orbit regime, so that will be our constraint. And the objective function is we want to maximize the co best coverage at the lowest altitude. To do this, we're going to utilize FreeFlyer's region and point group objects, as well as the sensor object, to calculate the point group coverage um, to determine that best coverage and then use the optimizer to find the lowest altitude. So before we dive into the problem too deep, we're going to talk through FreeFlyer's optimization workflow. We start by defining the problem. Inside this, pro or inside this block, we're going to configure the state variables and constraints, and then we'll also save objects to process. The next thing we'll do is we'll load the optimization engine, where we'll choose a third-party optimization library. We'll then create the evaluation loop. This is where we'll restore the saved objects, update state variables, perform analysis, update constraints, minimize or maximize the objective function, and generate output. And last but not least, we'll retrieve the best solution. And the best solution is not necessarily the final solution, but we'll visualize uh, what the optimizer has come up with in this case. So we'll start things off by defining the problem. And here's where we'll configure the state variables and constraints and save our objects to process. So same, this is going to be the same configuration as the Walker constellation example before with the addition of sensors. So you can do, uh, you can do things to the formation object in the same way, uh, to, I'm sorry, uh, for the formation object, you can edit all the spacecraft individually, uh, similar, so you have all the properties and methods associated with the spacecraft, so you can add sensors or additional subsystems like tanks, thrusters, and a loop. And in this case, we're adding a sensor object to our spacecraft. So you can see inside the loop, we'll be um, iterating through the constellation and then using the add sensor method call and setting the cone half angle equal to 20, 
for each of these sensors, and these sensors are going to be used to do coverage analysis with the point group. So for the optimization problem, um, from the objective slide, we know that the inclination and semi-major axis will be varied with each iteration of the optimizer. The optimizer.addState variable method is going to create a new entry in the state variables array. So for our example, we have the inclination and the semi-major axis as our two state variables. We'll first do the inclination. We have an initial guess of 45 degrees, so I'll point that out. A minimum of 10 degrees and a maximum of 90 degrees. For the semi-major axis, we're working in the LEO orbit regime, so we're going to have an initial guess of 7,000 kilometers, a minimum of 6,600 kilometers, and a maximum of 8,300 kilometers. The next thing we do is we want to save the objects to process. So we save objects into the optimization process, so they will be saved at the start of the process and automatically restored with each iteration. So essentially what's happening here is we are doing a save and restore every time the optimizer does an iteration. Otherwise, you would have to do it manually. So for this optimization problem, we want to save off the spacecraft in the formation. So again, we would be in a loop. We're going to save each individual spacecraft. So that's const i. And then we're also going to save the coverage array in the save objects to process method call. And that's going to be reset at the beginning of each loop so that we can calculate which points we actually have contact with in our propagation. The next thing we need to do is we need to load the optimization engine. So this is where we'll choose our third party optimization library. So we use the load engine method call. This loads the defined problem into a third party optimization library. You have the option to use IPOPT, NLOPT, or SNOPT in FreeFlyer. If you're using SNOPT, then you must provide your own path to the shared library file. Um, but just some advantages versus disadvantages for these different optimization engines. For IPOPT and SNOPT, you can use for all problem types, especially good for large sparse problems. And then for NLOPT, uh, you want to use only for small to medium sized problems because but it also has access to lots of algorithms such as global and non-derivative deriv algorithms. The next thing we'll talk about is creating the evaluation loop. This is where the bulk of our work is going to come in. So inside here, we'll save our restored, our restore our saved objects, update state variables, perform analysis, update constraints, minimize or maximize the objective function, and generate output. So we can see here, this is the evaluation loop. Again, this is where the bulk of the analysis will happen. And we're going to start things off with just showing a framework of what that evaluation loop looks like. So it starts with a while loop where we'll give some loop condition. And then again, we'll restore our save objects. Next, we'll update and retrieve state variables. We'll then perform analysis, update our constraints, and then minimize or maximize the objective function. So for the loop condition, we're going to start off. We have the is running method call. The is running method call returns false when the optimizer exits, even if an optimal solution is not found. This is going to be a good condition if the user would accept a solution that is feasible, but not necessarily optimal. You also have the has not converged method call, and this will return zero if the optimization engine has indicated that it has converged. For the purposes of this example, we'll be using the is running method call. The next thing we have to do is we have to reset objects. So in this case, for this example, we're going to use the restore objects and process method call. This will reset any objects that have been saved to the process with the save objects to process method. So for our example, we saved off the individual spacecraft. So at the beginning of each iteration, those spacecraft will be reset to their initial states as well as the coverage array. Additionally, we're going to use the point group dot reset method states uh, method call, and this will reset the point group dot coverage method for each iteration of the optimizer. So below you can see the script. So we have the optimizer dot restore objects and process method, followed by the point group dot reset method states call. The next thing we'll do is we'll update the state variables. 
So the update state variables method call advances all state variables to the optimizer's next guess. Additionally, we have the get state variable value, which stores this, the new state variable values in the appropriate object or properties for analysis. So in the script below, you can see we use the optimizer.update state variables method call. This will update the inclination in the semi-major axis for the spacecraft. And then we'll go through a loop of the individual spacecraft in the constellation, and we'll use the get state variable value, and we'll pull out the inclination and semi-major axis values for those spacecraft and assign them directly. The next thing to do is to create the cost function. So we'll calculate the cost function based on the semi-major axis of the spacecraft for each iteration of the optimizer. So recall from our original objective, we wanted to uh, design a constellation that gives us the maximum coverage at the lowest at the lowest semi-major axis or the lowest altitude. So here you can see uh, we've set up our cost function, set that equal to the const or the individual spacecraft semi-major axis. We use the get state variable value or method to pull out the uh, the lower bound from the the state variable array as well as the upper and lower bound, and that's going to define the cost function, which we'll see here in just a bit. And just as a note, um, this is specific to this optimization problem, but you can create whatever cost function or objective function you'd like um, for your optimization process. Because this is a coverage uh, problem, we need to talk about the spacecraft in region method. This in region method will return a value of one, when a spacecraft's subsatellite point is in a region. So the way we're doing this problem is we're going to use the instantaneous method for the in region to determine when our spacecraft are over the continental United States. That's going to be the screening region inside the method call here. And then once we've done that, we'll then further refine that problem to determine the individual points inside that region that have been seen by our sensors. We do that using the point group dot coverage method call. This provides sensor coverage analysis for a set of points defined by a point group. The coverage array will hold the coverage for the entire set of sensors, where a one indicates the point has been seen or in view of at least one sensor of the set. So here you can see we're going to use the point group coverage method. We'll do this inside a loop for each spacecraft, and then we'll store our coverage inside this coverage array and then determine the total coverage. So you can see in the table below, the index here represents the individual points inside this point group in the bottom right, where if a value is greater than one, then that means that the point has been seen. So in the case of index number two, this point number two has been seen by five different spacecraft uh, inside our formation. Point number three has been seen by two different spacecraft in our formation, so on and so forth. And we store that in our total coverage, which will be used for our final coverage analysis. Next thing we do is we calculate or maximize our objective. So we'll calculate the objective function uh, value for this loop iteration and pass it into the minimize or maximize method call. The final coverage fraction is determined by how many points were seen out of the entire point group. That value is then used for the objective function, taking into account the cost function, which is based on the semi-major axis. So again, remember, we wanted to get the most coverage at the lowest altitude. So our coverage fraction, it's the number of points seen out divided by the total number of points in the point group. And then we take into account our cost function, which was the semi-major axis, and then finally maximize that value. So now that we've done our evaluation loop, the next thing we have to do is retrieve the best solution. You can do this in FreeFly a number of different ways. Uh, we're going to be focusing on the get best state variable values method call for this example. This, uh, this method call returns an array containing the values of the state variables corresponding to the best solution so far. So in this case, that will pull out or we'll be able to retrieve from that method call the optimal semi-major axis and inclination for our constellation to visualize the best solution found in the optimization process. In addition to that method call, you have the optimizer.get best objective function value that will return the objective, uh, the, the objective value corresponding to the best feasible solution found so far. And lastly, you have the best get best constraint values method call which returns an array containing the values of the constraints corresponding to the best solution found so far. 
So now that we've defined our problem, we'll go ahead and take a look at the optimizer and work. So for this example, we're going to be using the continental United States. Go ahead and hit continue. So we have our two state variables on the left-hand side. And so for each iteration, we'll be seeing a new update uh, for the semi-major axis, as well as the inclination. In the top right, we have a plot that shows the cost function, which was based on the semi-major axis. The, uh, the coverage fraction, which determines the total number of points seen out of the total points in the point group, that defines the objective function. And so we want to maximize the orange in this plot. And the bottom right, I'll go ahead and replay it. You'll notice that this, uh, this grid window, which is a procedure in Free Flyer, will update with each iteration. So you can see uh, the current iteration. You can tell if the current iteration is feasible what the state variable values are for this current iteration, the maximum infeasibility, and what that objective function value is. And then in the bottom right, that's going to be the best solution so far, so best feasible solution to this point. So each time the optimizer finds a new best solution, that bottom section will update accordingly. And once we get to the end of our optimization process, this is where we'll pull out the best state variables and we can visualize our final solution. So for the continental United States, we filled this region out with point groups, and these point groups are going to be recolored based on the number of total revisits. You can see the constellation that has been designed here. Um, it looked like the final semi-major axis was roughly, uh, I think it was 6,800 kilometers with an inclination of 52 degrees for that specific plane. And you can see that we get some good recoloring of that point group over time. So how could we expand on this analysis? So for this example, uh, we just did one specific region for a region on Earth, which was the continental United States, but we don't have to stop there. You have the ability to change the central body for this optimization problem. So the necessary changes to the previous mission plan that I just demonstrated would be to change the constellation design. So you would need to set the correct central body based on the region of your choice. So in this case here on the right hand side, I designed this uh, this region on uh, Google Earth and then used a procedure in Free Flyer to fill that region with points and then put that on the moon and then design this constellation, obviously based around the moon. For the optimizer, I had to change the state variables based on the orbit regime. So in this case, it's going to be an LLO um, in place of the L or the LEO uh, orbit regime we worked with in the previous example. You could also change the constellation type. So the necessary changes to the previous mission plan here, again, would include the constellation design. So in the initial initialization process, you can define the number of planes and satellites per plane, as well as their initial parameters. So we've been talking a lot about Walker constellations in, in today's session. Uh, in this case, you could do a streets of coverage, rosettes. Uh, you could do single plane, multi-plane optimization in this case, uh, or constellation design rather. And then for the optimization portion, you could consider changing which orbital elements are solved for inside the optimization process. So for the state variables we configured, we did the semi-major axis and inclination. You could do things like RIN or true anomaly in other cases for your optimization problem. Additionally, uh, you could change the optimization problem as a whole. So for the example we looked at, it was a specific region uh, that we were doing for our coverage analysis. You could expand this to be coverage analysis at a global scale. You could do multiple region analysis. So instead of just the continental United States, you could add a region, say, in Australia or somewhere else on the Earth um, and define your optimization problem that way. Or in the case of the image here, you could determine uh, maximum duration for inter-satellite linking. So here we have a uh, constellation design based in uh, a few different shells um, in the low Earth orbit but um, using these vectors to visualize inter-satellite linking, you could determine uh, the best setup for that using an optimization um, problem. So some final remarks. Just a recap of what we covered. Uh, we want to utilize Free Flyers formation object to define constellations at a script level. We want to use mean element sets for longer propagations. We want to tune the uh, spacecraft force model for the necessary fidelity. And finally, we want to use Free Flyer's optimization capabilities to design your constellation around any objective function. 
uh, with the emphasis on any there. The objective function in this case, again, uh, was based on the lowest altitude with the highest coverage, but you can define any um, objective function when working with Free Flyers optimization process. With that said, I will go ahead and open the floor for Q&A. All right, thanks, Nate. We greatly appreciate that. Um, if anyone has any questions, you can feel free to post those in the Q&A um, or in the chat. Um, we do have one that came uh, earlier, Nate, and it says, is there a limit to the number of spacecraft that can be added to a constellation in Free Flyer? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, the answer to that is no, there is not a limit. We actually have a, a sample mission plan example. Uh, it's called debris field visualization, I believe. In that case, it's demonstrating the, the Fingid 1C, Iridium 33, and uh, Cosmos uh, debris that's, that's found up in space. And that's got around 10,000 elements, but you could go even beyond that. Uh, the, the key there is, again, going to be focused on the visualization aspect. When viewing a, a constellation or formation of that size, you're going to want to visualize it as points rather than as uh, the individual 3D models with the tails, not only for performance, but in that case, with that many elements, um, you're gonna, it's going to be very visually cluttering. So um, long story short, no, there is not a limit. Uh, you just want to make sure you're visualizing as points. Perfect. Thank you very much for that response. We've got another one here. It says, why does adding a tail for the satellite increase the runtime for the simulation? Yeah, that's a good question. So I'll go back to this slide again just to demonstrate once again. Uh, give me one moment. All right. So uh, the question here, again, is why does the 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 view window in the bottom left impact performance more than on the right. So not only are we storing uh, the the history of or the tail history for each of these spacecraft on the left, we're also visualizing sensors as well as their 3D models. Whereas on the right, we're just updating the state one time per step. We're just getting that one individual uh, data point, which is being used in the 3D visualization. One thing to note uh, in Free Flyer 8, which is is currently under development, we're we're hoping that this is no longer uh, going to make an impact on your performance. But currently, when you're just working with those larger scale constellations, it's just recommended to, to visualize as a point, Danny. Perfect. Perfect. Um, we got one from Abu Seda Hassan. And they, can the tool, can this tool, can Free Flyer, calculate harmful interference? It's an interesting question. So uh, one thing that I'll note in, I think it's this slide actually, uh, I'd say when it comes to harmful interference, I, I kind of consider that in the, the realm of collision avoidance. So Free Flyer does have the ability to, to calculate uh, probability of collision and use things like close approach uh, or do close approach analysis. I'd recommend reviewing the close approach maneuver sample mission plan. This is on, uh, this is just for two spacecraft individually, but you can do this for a, a for a larger uh, scale analysis. So that debris field visualization sample mission plan actually takes the ISS, propagates it through the debris um, and tells you how many potential conjunctures there are. And I would say the combination of those two mission plans would give you a good background um, for that quote unquote harmful interference analysis. Perfect. We have another one here from Samuel Martinez. He states, oops, is it possible to use Free Flyer to evaluate a similar region coverage problem, but for multi layer different height constellations? Yeah, that's a great question. So, when it comes to, I guess, multi layer different height, we kind of think of those as, as shells. In the case of this sample, or in the case of the mission plans I kind of built out or walked through today, the, the focus was on on planes, and then all those planes are at the same altitude. You could do the same type of analysis, uh, expanding beyond that by adding additional shells. So when we were solving for the, the semi-major axis in this optimization problem, um, you, could, you could expand that out so that you're solving for that, that optimal semi-major axis at each, of those, at each of those shells, not for just each of those planes independently. 
Okay, thank you. And Abu Zayda had uh, two more type of questions. Um, one he was meaning or referencing in his other question about radio frequency harmful interference. Sure. So when it comes to RF analysis or radio frequency analysis in free flyer, I would say uh, the focus here should be on what we have is called the RF link object in free flyer. Uh, this can be used to uh, to calculate things like your link budget and link analysis. I don't know that it's necessarily intended for use with uh, harmful interference, but you could potentially do some analysis in that in that realm um, using the combination of the the RF link object as well as uh, things like the visibility the visibility objects available in FreeFlyer to determine if if there might be a potential blocker um, in the way of your uh, your communications path. And additionally, we also have the uh, the field of view interference method call that was that was pointed out to me by a colleague. That's a good call. And to follow up, Abu Zayda, uh, and for everyone else on the call, um, we do have uh, complementary trial versions of the tool, um, so we can follow up uh, with anyone that's interested in in doing that as well. And we had another one that just came in. Um, are are there space debris models available for free flyer? So I wouldn't say there are space debris uh, space debris models available in free flyer, but free flyer does have the ability to connect to um, to places like Celeste Track. So when we talked about initializing a a formation earlier, uh, we focused today on initializing your formation. Uh, manually, I guess you could say, or explicitly defining the orbital states, but you can import a TLE object into FreeFlyer. So for the cases of the debris field visualization sample mission plan that we have, all that's doing is taking a uh, all that's doing is taking a TLE from a location like Celeste Track and then modeling that formation in FreeFlyer. So if you have access to a TLE that is um, a TLE that is representative of the the space debris, then you could you could definitely model that in free flyer. Okay. Here's another one, Nate. Uh, I think it was referred to in um, slide 22, maybe. It says, "What's the difference between the targeter and optimizer in free flyer?" Yeah, let me get back there. So, yeah, I mean, as the slide mentions here, so the first thing to note is that the targeter is available on the engineer tier. So if there are any students on the call that uh, might not be aware of the optimizer because it is on the mission tier, just reach out to, to the team, the tech support team, and we'd be happy to, to get you a new license so you can play around with the, the higher tier capabilities. But the targeter is going to be used to solve for what we call as a feasible solution. So. Again, that's solving that two-point boundary value problem uh, using the differential corrector method. The, the feasible solution wouldn't necessarily be the optimal solution, and that's where the optimizer comes into play. Uh, not only can it solve for that feasible solution, but it can continue along, and it works to maximize a user-defined objective function. Um, so the, the optimizer is kind of a, 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 better, <laughs> a better version of the targeter, uh, especially because you have access to those, those uh, third-party optimization libraries. Um, so yeah, feasible versus optimal. The optimizer can do both, whereas the targeter is just going to find a, a feasible, not necessarily an optimal solution. Okay, thank you, sir. Um, we got another one here that says, how would you handle modeling a constellation with multiple orbits or shells? Yeah, that's a good question. So one one way to kind of think about it when I talked first, I think it's actually the first slide, um, didn't make too much of an emphasis on the, the terminology here, but we have a um, we have the ability to do lists in Free Flyer. So one potential way to go about this would be to create a list of formation objects. Um, so that's essentially a list of a list of spacecraft. So where each formation would be a specific shell. So say shell one is at 750 kilometer altitude. 
Shell 2, could be 800, 900, whatever it may be. Um, but you, in order to kind of uh, better, uh, I guess, better organize your script, instead of doing individual formations for each of those, accessing the, the list of the formation might be the best way to go about that. And then it's just about loop control when it comes to actually defining elements um, inside those, those four loops. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, we have another one that says, is it possible to have a LiDAR camera in FreeFlyer that can be pointed at an object like a satellite to get real-time LiDAR data? Um, that's a good question. So what I would say you would use in FreeFlyer for that type of analysis would be a sensor object. Uh, we don't have any examples for LiDAR specifically, but for the sensor objects, uh, they can be used. Let me get back to my slide on it. Um, I think it's here. Yeah. So for the sensor object, uh, they can be used to model things like Earth sensors, sun sensors, antennas, star trackers, or in your case, a LiDAR camera, which as long as you have the position and orientation as well as the field of view, um, the sensor object can kind of mimic what that LiDAR, uh, that LiDAR camera would do. So you can use the, the sensor to determine where it would look, and then you could model the output. So the, the 3D view that I, I showed, that's just one example of, of output in, in FreeFlyer. You could do um, a different type of view, to, uh, such as a sensor view, to determine what that camera would actually be seeing in real time. Perfect, thank you. Just another call out to anyone that might have another question to post it in the Q&A. While we're waiting on that, uh, I have another one here that was pre-submitted. It says, what are the advantages or disadvantages of using different optimization engines like iPod, Snoop, and, and LPOP? <laughs> yeah, um, so for IPOPT and SNOPT, uh, these are going to be good engines. They're they're able to be used for all problem types, and that's especially true for large sparse problems. When it comes to NLOPT, you're going to want to use NLOPT only in the case of a small to medium sized problem. But NLOPT does offer uh, access to a lot of different algorithms, such as global and non derivative algorithms. If you go to the optimization engines page in the FreeFlyer help file, there's detailed information. Uh, and documentation on each of these specific engines, as well as all the available um, algorithms that NLOPT has to offer. All right, thank you for that. And let's see here, I think I got one more. Um, Nate, if you could go to the before we leave slide. So, a couple. A couple points here why Nate's going to the end. Um, Chris has been posting some links to our help files uh, on the chat side of the function here or the chat function inside Teams. So feel free to go there and, and copy and paste those into, uh, into your browser. And before you go, uh, we do want to mention uh, to take out your phones um, and click the QR code that you see on the screen now for our next uh, or I'll call it our first webinar of 2024, which is Contested Space, Automating SDA Training and Testing by our very own Stephen Poligo. It'll be on January 24th, 2024, same time slot, 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. So feel free to snap that QR code and sign up today, or you can copy and paste the URL uh, that Chris posted into the chat. And one last question, it says, as a student, I'm getting an error when trying to use the optimizer. What am I doing wrong? Help me, please. <laughs> yeah, the, the answer to your question is you're doing nothing wrong. Uh, students are given engineer tier licenses by default, but if you're looking to use uh, some of FreeFlyer's mission tier capabilities, such as optimization or potentially orbit determination or terrain capabilities, all you have to do is reach out to the, the licensing team or the support team at tech support at AISolutions.com. Um, we'd be happy to upgrade your license uh, so that you can access those, those mission tier capabilities. Awesome, thank you, Nate.
So we've got just a couple of minutes left. Uh, I'd like to kind of summarize everything and, and get you all on your way to your next call or possibly dinner um, or go back to bed uh, wherever you are on the planet. We'd appreciate, we greatly appreciate you taking time out of your day to attend the webinar this afternoon or this evening. Hey, thank you very, very much. It was a wonderful webinar. If you have any questions about licensing or trials or anything of that nature, um, feel free to email us at sales at ai-solutions.com. If you have any other follow-up questions, send them to that email address as well, sales at ai-solutions.com.